Chapter One, Part One of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Celine Major. The Mysteries of Paris, Volume Three by Eugène Sue. Chapter One, The Temple, Part One to the deep snow which had fallen during the past night had succeeded a very sharp wind so that the ordinarily muddy pavement was hard and dry as rigolette and rodolph wended onwards to the immense and singular bazaar called the temple the young girl leaning unceremoniously on the arm of her cavalier who on his part appeared as much at his ease as though they had been old familiar friends what a funny old woman madame pipelet is observed the grisette to her companion and what very odd things she says well i thought her remarks very striking as well as appropriate which of them neighbour why when she said young people would be young people and vive l'amour well well i only mean to say those are precisely my sentiments your sentiments yes i should like nothing better than to pass my youth with you taking vive l'amour for my motto i dare say for certainly you are not hard to please why where would be the harm are we not near neighbours of course we are or else i should not be seen walking out with you in this manner in broad day then you allow me to hope hope what that you will learn to love me oh bless you i do love you already really to be sure i do why how can i help it you are good and gay though poor yourself you have done all in your power by interesting rich people in the fate of the morals your appearance pleases me and you have altogether a nice look and a sort of air such as one is glad to find in a person we expect to go about with a great deal so there i think are abundant reasons for my loving you then suddenly breaking into loud fits of laughter rigolette abruptly exclaimed look there only look at that fat woman with the furred shoes what does she remind you of i'll tell you of a great sack being drawn along by two cats without tails and again she laughed merrily i would rather look at you my pretty neighbour than at all the fat old women or tailless cats in europe i am so delighted to find you already love me i only tell you the truth if i disliked you i should speak just as plainly i cannot reproach myself with ever having deceived or flattered any one but if a person pleases me i tell them so directly again interrupting the thread of her discourse the grisette drew up suddenly before the windows of a shop saying oh do pray only look at that pretty clock and those two handsome vases i had already saved up three francs and a half and had put it in my money-box to buy such a set as that in five or six years i might have been able to buy them saved up do you say then i suppose you earn at least thirty sous a day sometimes forty but i never reckon upon more than thirty which is the more prudent and i regulate all my expenses accordingly said rigolette with an air as important as though she was settling the financial budget but with thirty sous a day how do you manage to live oh bless you that is easily reckoned shall i tell you how i manage neighbour i fancy you are rather extravagant in your notions so perhaps it may serve as a lesson for you yes pray do well then thirty sous a day make five and forty francs a month do they not yes well then out of that i pay twelve francs for lodging that leaves me twenty-three francs for food etc is it possible twenty-three francs for one month's food yes really all that certainly for such a person as myself it does seem an enormous sum but then you see i deny myself nothing oh you little glutton ah but then remember i include the food for both my birds in that sum certainly it seems less exorbitant when you come to reckon for three than for one but just tell me how you manage day by day that i may profit by your good example well then be attentive and i will go over the different things i spend in it first of all one pound of bread that costs four sous then two sous worth of milk makes six four sous worth of vegetables in winter or fruit and salad in summer 
i am very fond of salad because like vegetables it is such a nice clean thing to prepare and does not soil the hands there goes ten sous at once then three sous for butter or oil and vinegar to season the salad with that makes thirteen sous a pail of nice fresh water oh i must have that it is my principal extravagance that brings it to fifteen sous don't you see then add two or three sous a week for chickweed and seed for my birds who generally have part of my bread and milk all this comes to exactly twenty-three francs a month neither more nor less and do you never eat meat meat indeed i should think not why it costs from ten to twelve sous a pound a likely thing for me to buy besides there is all the nuisance and smell of cooking instead of which milk vegetables or fruit are always ready when you wish for them i tell you what is a favourite dish of mine without being troublesome to prepare and which i excel in making oh pray let me know what it is why i get some beautiful ripe rosy apples and put them at the top of my little stove when they are quite tender i bruise them with a little milk and just a taste of sugar it is a dish for an emperor if you behave well i will let you taste it some day prepared by your hands it can scarcely fail being excellent but let us keep to our reckoning let me see we counted twenty-three francs for living etc and twelve francs for lodging that makes thirty-five francs a month well then out of the forty-five or fifty francs i earn there remains from ten to fifteen francs a month for my wood and oil during the winter as well as for my clothes and washing that is to say for soap and other requisites because excepting my sheets i wash my own things that is another of my extravagances a good laundress would pretty well ruin me while as i am a very quick and good ironer the expense is principally that of my own time during the five winter months i burn a load and a half of wood while i consume about four or five sous worth of oil for my lamp daily that makes it cost me about eighty francs a year for fire and lights so that you have in fact scarcely one hundred francs to clothe yourself and find you in pocket money no more yet out of that sum i manage to save my three francs and a half but your gowns your shoes this smart little cap as for caps i never wear one but when i go out so that is not ruinous and at home i go bareheaded as for my gowns and boots have i not got the temple to go to for them ah yes this convenient handy temple so you buy there all sorts of pretty and excellent dresses why only imagine great ladies are accustomed to give their old cast-off gowns etc to their maids when i say old i mean that perhaps they have worn them for a month or two just to ride out in the carriage well and then the ladies maids sell them to the persons who have shops at the temple for almost nothing just look at the nice dark merino dress i have on well i only gave fourteen francs for it when i make no doubt it cost at least sixty and had scarcely been put on i altered it to fit myself and i flatter myself it does me credit indeed it does and very great credit too yes i begin to see now thanks to the temple you really may contrive to make a hundred francs a year suffice for your dress to be sure why i can buy in the summer sweet pretty gowns for five or six francs boots like these i have on and almost new for two or three francs a pair just look at my boots now would not any one say they had been made for me said rigolette suddenly stopping and holding up one of her pretty little feet really very nicely set off by the well-fitting boot she wore it is indeed a charming foot but you must have some difficulty in getting fitted however i suppose at the temple they keep shoes and boots of all sizes from a woman's to a child's ah neighbour i begin to find out what a terrible flatterer you are however after what i have told you you must see now that a young girl who is careful and has only herself to keep may manage to live respectably on thirty sous a day to be sure the four hundred and fifty francs i brought out of prison with me helped me on famously for when people saw that i had my own furniture in my apartments they felt more confidence in entrusting me with work to take home i was some time though before i met with employment fortunately for me i had kept by me as much money as enabled me to live three months without earning anything shall i own to you that under so gay and giddy a manner 
i scarcely expected to hear so much sound sense as that uttered by your pretty mouth my good neighbour ah but let me tell you that when one is all alone in the world and has no wish to be under any obligation it is quite necessary as the proverb says to mind how we build our nest to take care of it when it is built and certainly yours is as charming a nest as the most fastidious bird could desire yes isn't it for as i say i never refuse myself anything now i consider my chamber as above my means in fact too handsome for one like me then i have two birds always at least two pots of flowers on my mantelpiece without reckoning those on the window ledges and yet as i told you i had actually got three francs and a half in my money-box towards the ornaments i hoped some day to be able to buy for my mantelpiece and what became of this store oh why lately when i saw the poor morels so very very wretched i said to myself what is the use of hoarding up these stupid pieces of money and letting them lie idle in a money-box when good and honest people are actually starving for want of them so i took out the three francs and lent them to morel when i say lent i mean i told him i only lent them to spare his feelings but of course i never meant to have them back again yes but my dear neighbour you cannot refuse to let them repay you now they are so differently situated why no i think if morel were to offer them to me now i should not refuse them it will at any rate enable me to begin my store for buying the chimney ornaments i do so long to possess you would scarcely believe how silly i am but i almost dream of a beautiful clock such as the one i showed you just now and two lovely vases one on each side but then you should think a little of the future what future suppose you were to be ill for instance me ill oh the idea and the fresh hearty laugh of rigolette resounded through the street well why should you not be do i look like a person likely to be sick certainly i never saw a more bright or blooming countenance well then what could possibly have put it into your head to talk such nonsense as to suppose i could ever be ill nay but why i am only eighteen years of age and considering the sort of life i lead there is no chance of such a thing i rise at five o'clock winter or summer i am never up after ten or at latest eleven i eat sufficient to satisfy my appetite which certainly is not a very great one i do not suffer from exposure to cold i work all day singing as merrily as a lark and at night i sleep like a dormouse my heart is free light and happy my employers are so well satisfied with what i do for them that i am quite sure not to want for work so what is there for me to be ill about it really is too amusing to hear you try to talk sense and only utter nonsense me ill and at the very absurdity of the idea rigolette again burst into an immoderate fit of laughter so loud and prolonged that a stout gentleman who was walking before her carrying a dog under his arm turned around quite angrily believing all this mirth was excited by his presence resuming her composure rigolette slightly curtsied to the stout individual and pointing to the animal under his arm said is your dog so very tired sir the fat man grumbled out some indistinct reply and continued on his way my dear neighbour said rodolph are you losing your senses it is your fault if i am how so because you talk such nonsense to me do you call my saying that perhaps you might be ill talking foolishly and once more overcome by the irresistible mirth awakened by the absurdity of rodolph's suggestion rigolette again relapsed into long and hearty fits of laughter while rodolph deeply struck by this blind yet happy reliance upon the future felt angry with himself for having tried to shake it though he almost shuddered as he pictured to himself the havoc a single month's illness would make in this peaceful mode of life then the implicit reliance entertained by rigolette on the stability of her employ and her youthful courage her sole treasures struck rodolph as breathing the very essence of pure and contented innocence for the confidence expressed by the young dressmaker arose neither from recklessness nor improvidence but from an instinctive dependence and belief in that divine justice which would never forsake a virtuous and industrious creature a simple girl 
whose greatest crime was in relying too confidently on the blessed gifts of youth and health the precious boon of a heavenly benefactor do the birds of the air remember as they flit on gay and agile wing amidst the blue skies of summer or skim lightly over the sweet-smelling fields of blooming lucerne that bleak cold winter must follow so much enjoyment then said rodolph to the grisette it seems you have no wish for anything more than you already possess no really i have not positively nothing you desire no i tell you stay yes now i recollect there are those sweet pretty chimney ornaments but i shall be sure to have them some of these days though i do not know exactly when but still they do so run in my head that sooner than be disappointed i will sit up all night to work and besides these ornaments oh nothing more no i cannot recollect any one other thing i care for more especially now why now particularly because yesterday if you had asked me the same question i should have replied there was nothing i wanted more than an agreeable neighbour in your apartments to give me an opportunity of showing all the little acts of kindness i have been accustomed to perform and to receive nice little attentions in return well but you know my dear neighbour we have already entered into an agreement to be mutually serviceable to each other you will look after my linen for me and i shall clean up and polish your chamber for you and besides attending to my linen you are to wake me every morning early by tapping against the wainscot and do you think you have named all i shall expect you to do what else can i do oh bless you you have not yet come to the end of your services why do you not intend to take me out every sunday either to the boulevards or beyond the barriers you know that is the only day i can enjoy a little pleasure to be sure i do and when summer comes we will go into the country no no i hate the country i cannot bear to be anywhere but in paris yet i used once upon a time to go out of good nature with a young friend of mine who was with me in prison to visit meudon and st germain my friend was a very nice good girl and because she had such a sweet voice and was always singing people used to call her the goualeuse and what has become of her i don't know she spent all the money she brought with her out of prison without seeming to have much pleasure for it she was inclined to be mournful and serious though kind and sympathizing to every one at the time we used to go out together i had not met with any work to do but directly i procured employment i never allowed myself a holiday i gave her my address but as she never came to see me i suppose she like myself was too busy to spare the time but i dare say you don't care to hear any more about her i only mentioned it because i wanted to show you that it is no use asking me to go into the country with you for i never did and never will go there except with the young friend i was telling you about but whenever you can afford to take me out to dinner or to the play i shall be quite ready to accompany you and when it does not suit you to spend the money or when you have none to spend why then we will take a walk and have a good look at the shops which is almost the nicest thing i know unless it is buying at them and i promise you you shall have no reason to feel ashamed of my appearance let us go out among ever such company oh when i wear my dark blue levantine silk gown i flatter myself i do look like somebody it is such a love of a dress and it fits me so beautifully i never wear it but on sundays and then i put on such a love of a lace cap trimmed with a shaded orange colour riband which looks so well with dark hair like mine then i have some such elegant boots of satin hue made for me not bought at the temple and last of all comes such a shawl oh neighbour i doubt if you ever walked with any one in such perfect beauty it is a real bourre de soie an imitation of cashmere i quite expect we shall be stared at and admired by every one as we go along the men will look back as they pass me and say upon my word that's an uncommon pretty-looking girl she is pon honour then the woman will cry what a stylish-looking man do you see that tall thin person i declare he has such a fashionable appearance that he might pass as somebody if he liked what a becoming and handsome mustachio he has and between ourselves neighbour i quite agree with these remarks and especially about the mustachio for i dearly love to see a man wear them unfortunately m germain did not wear a mustachio 
on account of the situation he held i believe his employer did not permit his young men to wear them to be sure m cabrion did wear mustachios but then his were quite red like his great bushy beard and i hate those huge beards and besides i did not like cabrion for two other reasons one was he used to play all kinds of scampish tricks out in the street and the other thing i disliked was his tormenting poor old pipelet as he did certainly m giraudeau the person who lived next to me before m cabrion was rather a smart-looking man and dressed very well but then he squinted and at first that used to put me out very much because he always seemed to be looking past me at some one by my side and i always found myself without thinking of it turning around to see who it could be and here rigolette indulged in another peal of merry laughter as rodolph listened to all this childish and voluble talk he felt almost at a loss how to estimate the pretensions of the grisette to be considered of first-rate prudence and virtue sometimes the very absence of all her reserve in her communications and the recollection of the great bolt on her door made him conclude that she bore a general and platonic affection only for every occupant of the chamber adjoining her own and that her interest in them was nothing more than that of a sister but again he smiled at the credulity which could believe such a thing possible when the unprotected condition of the young dressmaker and the fascinations of messrs giraudeau cabrion and germain were taken into account still the frankness and originality of rigolette made him pause in the midst of his doubts and refused to allow him to judge harshly of the ingenuous and light-hearted being who tripped beside him i am delighted at the way you have disposed of my sundays said rodolphe gaily i see plainly we shall have some capital treats stop a little mr extravagance and let me tell you how i mean to regulate our expenses in the summer we can dine beautifully either at the chartreuse or the montmartre hermitage for three francs then half a dozen quadrilles or waltzes and a ride upon the wooden horses oh i do so love riding on horseback well that will bring it all together to about five francs not a farthing more i assure you do you waltz yes very well i am glad of that m cabrion always trod on my toes so that he quite put me out and then too by way of a joke he used to throw fulminating balls about on the ground so at last the people at the chartreuse would not allow us to be admitted there oh i promise you to be very well behaved whenever we are met together and as for the fulminating balls i promise you never to have anything to do with them but when winter comes how shall we manage then why in the winter we shall be able to dine very comfortably for forty sous i think people never care so much for eating in the winter as summer so then we shall have three francs left to pay for our going to the play for i shall not allow you to exceed a hundred sous for the whole of our expenses and that is a great deal of money to spend in pleasure but then if you were out alone it would cost you much more at the tavern or billiard-rooms where you would only meet a parcel of low ignorant men smelling of tobacco enough to choke you is it not much better for you to pass a pleasant day with a nice little cheerful good-tempered companion who in return for the holiday you so agreeably pass with her will contrive to make up the extra expense she costs you by hemming your handkerchiefs and looking after your domestic affairs nothing can be more advantageous as far as i am concerned but suppose any of my friends should meet me walking with my pretty neighbour what then what then why they would just look at you and then at me and then they would smile and say that's a lucky fellow that rodolphe you know my name do you why of course when i heard that the chamber adjoining mine was let i inquired the name of the person who had taken it yes i dare say every one who met us together would remark as you observe what a lucky fellow i was then the next thing would be to envy me so much the better they would believe i was perfectly happy of course of course they would all the while i should only be so in appearance well what does that signify as long as people think you happy what does it matter whether you are really so or not men neither require nor care for more than outward show but your reputation might suffer rigolette burst into an uncontrollable fit of laughter the reputation of a grisette said she do you suppose that any person believes in such a phenomenon ah 
if i had either father mother brother or sister for their sakes i should fear what people might say of me and be anxious about the world's opinion but i am alone in the world and i have no person to consider but myself so while i know myself to be free from blame or reproach i care not for what any one may say of me or think either but still i should be very unhappy what for to pass for being a happy as well as a lucky fellow when after the fashion of papa Cretu's dinner i should be expected to make a meal off a dry crust while all the tempting dishes contained in a cookery book were being read to me oh nonsense you will be quite contented to live as i describe you will find me so grateful for every little act of kindness so easily pleased and so little troublesome that i know you will say why after all i may as well spend my sunday with her as with any one else if you have any time in the evening and have no objection to come and sit with me you can have the use of my fire and light if it would not tire you to read aloud you would amuse me by reading some nice novel or romance better do that than lose your money at cards or billiards otherwise if you are occupied at your office or prefer going to a cafe you can just bid me good-night when you come in if i happen still to be up but should i have gone to bed why then i will wish you good morning at an early hour next day by tapping against your wainscot to awaken you why m germain my last fellow-lodger used to pass all his evenings with me in that manner and never complained of their being dull he read me all walter scott's novels in the course of the winter which was really very amusing sometimes when it chanced to be a wet sunday he would go and buy something at the pastry cook's and we used to have a nice little dinner in my room and afterwards we amused ourselves with reading and we liked that almost as well as going to the theatre you see by this that i am not hard to please but on the contrary am always ready to do what i can to make things pleasant and agreeable and then you were talking about illness oh if ever you should be ill then indeed i should be a comfort to you a real sister of charity only ask the morels what sort of a nurse i am you don't half know your own good fortune monsieur rodolphe you have drawn a real prize in the lottery of good luck to have me for a neighbour i can assure you i quite agree with you but i always was lucky apropos of your late fellow-lodger m germain where is he at present in paris i believe then you do not see much of him now no he has never been to see me since he quitted the house but where is he living and what is he doing at present why do you want to know because said rodolph smiling i am jealous of him and i wish jealous exclaimed rigolette bursting into a fit of laughter la bless you there is no occasion for that poor fellow but seriously my good neighbour i wish most particularly to obtain m germain's address or to be enabled to meet him you know where he lives and without any boast i think i have good reason to expect you would trust me with the secret of his residence and to believe me quite incapable of revealing again the information i ask of you assuring you most solemnly it is for his own interest more than mine i am solicitous of finding him and seriously my good neighbour although it is probable and possible your intentions towards m germain are as you report them i am not at liberty to give you the address of m germain he having strictly and expressly forbidden my doing so to any person whatever therefore when i refuse to tell you you may be quite sure it is because i really am not at a liberty to do so and that ought not to make you feel offended with me if you had entrusted me with a secret you would be pleased would you not to have me as careful of it and determined not to reveal it as i am about m germain's affair nay but neighbour once and for all do not say anything more on this subject i have made a promise which i will keep faithfully and honourably so now you know my mind and if you ask me a hundred times i shall answer you just the same End of chapter one part one read by celine major chapter one part two of the mysteries of paris volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris volume three by eugene sue chapter one part two of the temple spite of her thoughtlessness and frivolity 
the young dressmaker pronounced these last words with so much firmness that to his great regret rodolph perceived the impossibility of gaining the desired information respecting germain through her means and his mind revolted at the idea of laying any snare to entrap her into a betrayal of her secret he therefore after a slight pause gaily replied well let us say no more about it then but upon my life i don't wonder at you who can so well keep the secrets of others guarding your own so closely me have secrets cried rigolette i only wish i had some more secrets of my own it must be very amusing to have secrets do you really mean to assert that you have not a nice little secret about some love affair love affair are you going to persuade me you have never been in love said rodolph looking fixedly at rigolette the better to read the truth in her tell-tale features been in love why of course i have with m giraudeau m cabrion m germain and you are you sure you love them just as you do me neither more nor less oh really i cannot tell you so very exactly if anything i should say less because i had to become accustomed to the squinting eyes of m giraudeau the disagreeable jokes and red beard of m cabrion and the low spirits and constant dejection of m germain for the poor young man was very sad and always seemed to have a heavy load on his mind while you on the contrary took my fancy directly i saw you come now my pretty neighbour you must not be angry with me i am going to speak candidly and sincerely like an old friend oh don't be afraid to say anything to me i am very good-natured and besides i feel certain you are too kind you could never have the heart to say anything to me that would give me pain you are quite right but do tell me truly have you never had any lovers lovers i should think not what time have i for such things what has time got to do with it why everything to be sure in the first place i should be jealous as a tigress and i should be continually worrying myself with one idea or another and let me ask you whether you think it is likely i could afford to lose two or three hours a day in fretting and grieving and then suppose my lover were to turn out false oh what tears it would cost me how wretched i should be all that sort of thing would put me sadly behindhand with my work i can tell you well but all lovers are not faithless and a cause of grief and sorrow to their mistress oh bless you it would still be worse for me if you were all goodness and truth why then i should not be able to live without him for a single hour and as most probably he would be obliged to remain all day in his office or shop or manufactory i should be like some poor restless spirit all the time of his absence i should imagine all sorts of things picture to myself his being at that moment pleasantly engaged in company with one he loved better than myself and then if he forsook me oh heaven only knows what i might be tempted to do in my despair or what might become of me one thing is very certain that my work would suffer from it and then what should i do why quietly as i live at present it is much as i can manage to live by working from twelve to fifteen hours a day where should i be if i were to lose three or four days a week by tormenting myself how could i ever catch up all that time oh i never could it would be quite impossible i shall be obliged then to take a situation to live under the control of a mistress but no no i will never bring myself to that i love my liberty too well your liberty yes i might go as forewoman to the person who keeps the warehouse for which i work she would give me four hundred francs a year with board and lodging and you will not accept it no indeed i should then be the slave and servant of another whereas however humble my home at least there is no one there to control me i am free to come and go as i please i owe nothing to any one i have good health good courage good heart and good spirits and now that i can say a good neighbour also what is there left to desire then you have never thought of marriage marriage indeed why what would be the use of my thinking about it when poor as i am i could not expect to meet with a husband better off than myself look at the poor morels just see the consequences of burthening yourself with a family before you have the means of providing for one 
whilst so long as there is only oneself to provide for one can always manage somehow and do you never build castles in the air never dream dream oh yes of my chimney ornaments but besides them what can i have to wish for but suppose now some relation you never heard of in your life were to die and leave you a nice little fortune twelve hundred francs a year for instance you have made five hundred sufficient to supply all your wants perhaps it might prove a good thing perhaps a bad one how could it be a bad one because i am happy and contented as i am but i do not know what i might be if i came to be rich i can assure you that when after a hard day's work i go to bed in my own snug little room when my lamp is extinguished and by the glimmer of the few cinders left in my stove i see my neat clean little apartment my curtains my chest of drawers my chairs my birds my watch my table covered with the work confided to me left all ready to begin the first thing in the morning and i say to myself all this is mine i have no one to thank for it but myself oh neighbour their very thoughts lull me into such a happy state of mind that i fall asleep believing myself the most fortunate creature on earth to be so surrounded with comforts but i declare here we are at the temple you must own it is a beautiful object although not partaking of the profound admiration expressed by rigolette at the first glimpse of the temple rodolph was nevertheless much struck by the singular appearance of this enormous bazaar with its many diverging passages and dependencies towards the middle of the rue du temple not far from the fountain which stands in the corner of a large square may be seen an immense parallelogram built of wood and surmounted with a slated roof this building is the temple bounded on the left by the rue du petit soir and on the right by the rue percé it leads to a large circular building a colossal rotunda surrounded with a gallery forming a sort of arcade a long opening intersecting this parallelogram in its length and breadth divides it into two equal parts which are again divided and subdivided into an infinity of small lateral and transverse openings crossing each other in all directions and sheltered by the roof of the building from all severity of weather in this bazaar new merchandise is generally prohibited but the smallest fragment of any sort of material the merest morsel of iron brass lead or pewter will here find both a buyer and a seller here are to be found dealers in pieces of every coloured cloth of all ages qualities shades and capabilities for the service of such as wish to repair or alter damaged or ill-fitting garments some of the shops present huge piles of old shoes some trodden down of heel others twisted torn worn split and in holes presenting a mass of nameless formless colourless objects among which are grimly visible some species of fossil soles about an inch thick studded with thick nails resembling the door of a prison and hard as a horse's hoof the actual skeletons of shoes whose other component parts have long since been consumed by the devouring hand of time yet all this mouldy dried-up accumulation of decaying rubbish will find a willing purchaser an extensive body of merchants trading in this particular line then there are the vendors of gimps fringes bindings cords tassels and edgings of silk cotton or thread arising out of the demolition of curtains past all cure and defying all reparation other enterprising individuals devote themselves to the sale of females hats and bonnets these articles only reaching their emporium by the means of the dealers in old clothes and after having performed the strangest journeys and undergone the most surprising transformations the most singular changes of colour in order that the article traded in may not take up too much room in a warehouse ordinarily the size of a large box these bonnets are carefully folded in half then flattened and laid upon each other as closely as they can be packed with the exception of the brim they are treated in every respect the same as herrings requiring to be stowed in a cask by these means it is almost incredible what a quantity of these usually fragile articles may be accommodated in a small space of about four feet square should a purchaser present himself the various specimens are removed from the high pressure to which they have been exposed the vendor with a dégagé air gives the crown a dexterous blow with his fist which makes the centre rise to its accustomed situation then presses the front out upon his knee 
concluding by holding up with an air of intense satisfaction at his own ingenuity an object so wild so whimsical and withal so irresistibly striking as to remind one of those traditional costumes ascribed for ages past to fishwomen apple-women or any whose avocation involves the necessity of carrying a basket on the head farther on at the sign of the goût du jour beneath the arcades of the rotunda elevated at the end of the large opening which intersects the temple and divides it into two parts are suspended myriads of vestments of all colours forms and fashions even more various and extraordinary in their respective styles than the bonnets just described there may be seen stylish coats of unbleached linen adorned with three rows of brass buttons a la hussarde and sprucely ornamented with a small fur collar of fox skin great coats originally bottle green but changed by age and service to the hue of the pistachio nut edged with black braid and set off with a bright flaming lining of blue and yellow plaid giving quite a fresh and youthful appearance and producing the most genteel and tasty effect coats that when new bore the appellation as regards their cut of being a queue de morue of a dark drab colour with velvet shag or plush collar and further decorated with buttons once silver gilt but now changed to a dull coppery hue in the same emporium may be observed sundry pelisses or polonaise of maroon coloured cloth with catskin collar trimmed with braiding and rich in brandenburg's tassels and cords not far from these are displayed a great choice of dressing-gowns most artistically constructed out of old cloaks whose triple collars and capes have been removed the inside lined with remnants of printed cotton the most in request being blue or dark green made up here and there with pieces of various distinct shades and embroidered with old braid and lined with red cotton on which is traced a flowing design in vivid orange collar and cuffs similarly adorned a cord for the waist made out of an old bell rope serves as a finish to those elegant deshabillés so exultingly worn by robert macaire we shall briefly pass over a mass of costumes more or less uncouth in the midst of which may be found some real and authentic relics of royalty or greatness dragged by the revolution of time from the palaces of the rich and mighty to the dingy shelves of the rotunda of the temple these displays of old shoes hats and coats are the grotesque parts of the bazaar the place where rags and faded finery seek to set up their claim to notice but it must be allowed or rather distinctly asserted that the vast establishment we are describing is of immense utility to the poor or persons in mediocre circumstances there they may purchase at an amazing decrease of price most excellent articles nearly new and whose wear has been little or none one side of the temple was devoted to articles of bedding and contained piles of blankets sheets mattresses and pillows farther on were carpets curtains every description of useful household utensil close at hand were stores of wearing apparel shoes stockings caps and bonnets for all ages as well as all classes and conditions all these articles were scrupulously clean and devoid of anything that could offend or shock the most fastidious person those who have never visited this bazaar will scarcely credit in how short a space of time and with how little money a cart may be filled with every requisite for the complete fitting out of two or three utterly destitute families rodolph was particularly struck with the manner at once attentive eager and cheerful of the various dealers as standing at the door of their shops they solicited the patronage and custom of the passers-by their mode of address at once familiar and respectful seemed altogether unlike the tone of the present day scarcely had rigolette and her companion entered that part of the place devoted to the sale of bedding than they were surrounded by the most seducing offers and solicitations walk in sir and look at my mattresses if you please said one they are quite new i will just open a corner to show you how beautifully white and soft the wool is more like the wool of a lamb than a sheep my pretty lady step in and see my beautiful fine white sheets they are better than you for the first stiffness has been taken out of them they are soft as a glove and strong as iron come my new married couple treat yourselves to one of my handsome counterpanes only see how soft light and warm it is quite as good as eiderdown every bit the same as new never been used twenty times now then my good lady persuade your husband to treat you to one let me have the pleasure of serving you and i will fit you up for housekeeping as cheaply as you can desire 
oh you'll be pleased i know you'll come again to see mother bouvard you will find i keep everything i bought a splendid lot of second-hand goods yesterday pray walk in and let me have the pleasure of showing them to you come you may as well see if you don't buy i shall charge you nothing for looking at them i tell you what neighbour said rodolph to rigolette this fat old lady shall have the preference she takes us for husband and wife i am so pleased with her for the idea that i decide upon laying out my money at her shop well then let it be the fat old lady said rigolette i like her appearance too rigolette and her companion then went into mother bouvard's by a magnanimity perhaps unexampled before in the temple the rivals of mother bouvard made no disturbance at the preference awarded to her one of her neighbours indeed went so far as to say so long as it is mother bouvard and no one else that has this customer she has a family and is the dowager and the honour of the temple it was indeed impossible to have a face more prepossessing more open and more frank than that of the dowager of the temple here my pretty little woman she said to rigolette who was looking at sundry articles with the eye of a connoisseur this is a second-hand bargain i told you of two bed furnitures and bedding complete and as good as new if you would like a small old secretaire very cheap here is one and mother bouvard pointed to one i had it in the same lot i do not usually buy furniture but i could not refuse this for the poor people of whom i had it appeared to be so very unhappy poor lady it was the sale of this piece of furniture which seemed to cut her to the very heart i dare say it was a family piece of furniture at these words and whilst the shopkeeper was settling with rigolette as to the prices of the various articles of purchase rodolph was attentively looking at the secretaire which mother bouvard had pointed out it was one of those ancient pieces of rosewood furniture almost triangular in shape closed by a front panel which let down and supported by two long brass hinges served for a writing-table in the centre of this panel which was inlaid with ornaments of wood of different patterns rodolph observed a cipher let in of ebony and which consisted of an m and an r intertwined and surmounted with the count's coronet he conjectured therefore that the last possessor of this piece of furniture was a person in an elevated rank of society his curiosity increased and he looked at the secretaire with redoubled scrutiny he opened the drawers mechanically one after the other when having some difficulty in drawing out the last and trying to discover the obstacle he perceived and drew carefully out a sheet of paper half shut up between the drawer and the bottom of the opening whilst rigolette was concluding her bargain with mother bouvard rodolph was engrossed in examining what he had found from the numerous erasures which covered this paper he perceived that it was the copy of an unfinished letter rodolph with considerable difficulty made out what follows sir be assured that the most extreme misery alone could compel me to the step which i now take it is not mistaken pride which causes my scruples but the absolute want of any and every claim on you for the service which i am about to ask the sight of my daughter reduced as well as myself to the most frightful destitution has made me throw aside all hesitation a few words only as to the cause of the misfortunes which have overwhelmed me after the death of my husband all my fortune was three hundred thousand francs twelve thousand livres which was placed by my brother with m jacques ferrand the notary i received at angers whether i had settled with my daughter the interest of this sum remitted to me by my brother you know sir the horrible event which put an end to his days ruined as it seems by secret and unfortunate speculations he put an end to his existence eight months since after this sad event i received a few lines written by him in desperation before this awful deed when i should peruse them he wrote he should no longer exist he terminated this letter by informing me that he had not any acknowledgment of the sum which he had placed in my name with m jacques ferrand as that individual never gave any receipt but was honour and piety itself that therefore it would be sufficient for me to present myself to that gentleman and my business would be regularly and satisfactorily adjusted as soon as i was able to turn my attention to anything besides the mournful end of my poor brother i came to paris where i knew no one sir but yourself and you only by the connection that i had subsisted between yourself and my husband 
i have told you that the sum deposited with m jacques ferrand was my entire fortune and that my brother forwarded to me every six months the interest which arose from that sum more than a year had elapsed since the last payment and consequently i went to m jacques ferrand to ask the amount of him as i was greatly in want of it scarcely was i in his presence than without any consideration of my grief he accused my brother of having borrowed two thousand francs of him which he had lost by his death adding that not only was suicide a crime before god and man but also that it was an act of robbery of which he m jacques ferrand was the victim i was indignant at such language for the remarkable probity of my poor brother was well known he had it is true unknown to me and his friends lost his fortune in hazardous speculations but he had died with an unspotted reputation deeply regretted by all and not leaving any debt except to his notary i replied to m ferrand that i authorized him at once to take the two thousand francs which he claimed from my brother from the three hundred thousand francs of mine which had been deposited with him at these words he looked at me with an air of utter astonishment and asked me what three hundred thousand francs i alluded to to those which my brother placed in your hands eighteen months ago sir and of which i have till now received the interest paid by you through my brother i replied not comprehending his question the notary shrugged his shoulders smiled disdainfully as if my words were not serious and replied that so far from depositing any money with him my brother had borrowed two thousand francs from him it is impossible for me to express to you my horror at this reply what then has become of this sum i exclaimed my daughter and myself have no other resource and if we are deprived of that nothing remains for us but complete wretchedness what will become of us i really don't know replied the notary coldly it is most probable that your brother instead of placing this sum with me as you say has used it in those unfortunate speculations in which unknown to any one he was engaged it is false sir i exclaimed my brother was honour itself and so far from despoiling me and my daughter he would have sacrificed himself for us he would never marry in order that he might leave all he had to my child dare you to assert madam that i am capable of denying a deposit confided in me inquired the notary with indignation which seems so honourable and sincere that i replied no certainly not sir your reputation for probity is well known but yet i can never accuse my brother of so cruel an abuse of confidence what are your proofs of this claim inquired m ferrand i have none sir eighteen months since my brother who undertook the management of my affairs wrote to me saying i have an excellent opportunity of obtaining six per cent send me your power of attorney to sell your stock and i will deposit the three hundred thousand francs which i will make up with m jacques ferrand the notary i sent the papers which he asked for to my brother and a few days afterwards he informed me that the investment was made by you and at the end of six months he remitted to me the interest due at least then you have some letters on this subject madame no sir they were only on family matters and i did not preserve them unfortunately madame i cannot do anything in this matter replied the notary if my honesty was not beyond all suspicion all attack i should say to you the courts of law are open to you attack me the judges will have to choose between the word of an honourable man who for thirty years has had the esteem of worthy men and the posthumous declaration of a man who after being ruined in most foolish undertakings has found refuge only in suicide i say to you now attack me madame if you dare and your brother's memory will be dishonoured but i believe you will have the good sense to resign yourself to a misfortune which no doubt is very severe but to which i am an entire stranger but sir i am a mother if my fortune is lost my daughter and i have nothing left but a small stock of furniture if that is sold we have nothing left sir nothing but the most frightful destitution staring us in the face you have been cheated it is a misfortune but i can do nothing in the matter answered the notary once more madame your brother has deceived you if you doubt between his word and mine attack me go to law and the judges will decide i quitted the notaries in the deepest despair but what could i do in this extremity i had no means of providing the validity of my claim i was convinced of the strict honour of my brother and confounded at the assertion of m ferrand and having no person to whom i could turn for advice for you were travelling and knowing that i must have money to pay for legal opinions and advice 
and desiring to preserve the very little that i had left i dared not commence a suit at law it was at this juncture this sketch of the letter ended here for what followed was covered with ink erasures which completely blotted out the lines at the bottom of the page and in the corner rodolph found this kind of memorandum to write to the duchesse de lucenay for m de saint remy rodolph remained deeply thoughtful after the perusal of this fragment of a letter in which he had found two names whose connection struck him although the fresh infamy which appeared to accuse jacques ferrand was not proved yet this man had proved himself so pitiless towards the unhappy morel had behaved so shamefully to louise his daughter that the denial of a deposit protected by certain impunity on the part of such a wretch appeared to him by no means improbable this mother who claimed a fortune which had disappeared so strangely was doubtless used to a life of ease and comfort ruined by a sudden blow and knowing no one in paris as the letter said what must have been the existence of these two females perhaps utterly destitute and alone in the midst of this vast metropolis End of chapter one part two read by celine major chapter one part three of the mysteries of paris volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris volume three by eugene sue chapter one part three of the temple the prince had as we know promised sure occupation to madame by giving her accidentally and to employ her mind a part to play in some future work of charity being certain to find sure misery for her to curtail before his next meeting with that lady he thought that perhaps chance might bring him before some unfortunate and worthy person who would as he trusted interest the heart and imagination of madame d'harville the sketch of the letter which he held in his hands and the copy of which had doubtless never been sent to the person whose assistance was implored evinced a high and resigned mind which would revolt from an offer of alms so then how many precautions how many plans how much delicacy must be employed to conceal the source of such generous succour or to make it accepted and then how much address to introduce oneself to such a female in order to judge if she really merited the interest which she seemed capable of inspiring rodolph foresaw in the development of this mysterious affair a multitude of new and touching emotions which would singularly attract madame d'harville in the way he had previously proposed to her well husband said rigolette gaily to rodolph what is there so interesting in that piece of paper which you are reading there my little wife replied rodolph you are very inquisitive i will tell you by and by have you bought all you want yes and your poor friends will be set up like kings there is nothing to do now but to pay madame bouvard has made every allowance i must do her that credit my little wife an idea occurs to me whilst i am paying suppose you go and choose the clothes for madame morel and her children i confess my ignorance on the subject of such purchases you can tell them to bring everything here and then all the things will be together and the poor people will have everything at once you are right husband wait here and i shall not be long i know two shopkeepers here where i am a regular customer and i shall find in their shops all i require and rigolette went out saying madame bouvard take care of my husband and do not flirt with him mind whilst i'm gone and then came the laugh and away the merry maiden ran i must say sir said mother bouvard to rodolph that you have a capital little manager there peste she knows how to make a bargain and then she is so prettily behaved and pretty looking red and white with those large beautiful black eyes and such hair is she not charming and ain't i a happy husband madame bouvard as happy a husband as she is a wife i am sure of that you are not mistaken but tell me how much i owe you your little lady would only give me three hundred and thirty francs for the whole as true as heaven's above us i only make fifteen francs by the bargain for i did not try to get the things as cheaply as i might for i hadn't the heart to bait em down the people who sold em seemed so uncommon miserable really were they the same people that you bought this little secretaire of yes sir and it cuts my heart to think of it only imagine the day before yesterday there came here a young and still pretty girl but so pale and thin one could almost see through her 
and you know that pains people that have any feeling at all although she was as they say neat as a new-made pin her old threadbare black worsted shawl her black stuff gown which was also worn bare her straw bonnet in the month of january for she was in mourning all showed what we call great distress for i am sure she was a real lady at last blushing up to the very eyes she asked me if i would buy two beds and bedding complete and a little old secretaire i said that as i sold of course i bought and that if they would suit me i would have them but that i must see the things she then asked me to go with her to her apartment not far off on the other side of the boulevards in a house on the quay of st martin's canal i left my niece in the shop and followed the lady until we reached a smallish house at the bottom of a court we went up to the fourth floor and the lady having knocked the door was opened by a young girl about fourteen years of age who was also in mourning and equally pale and thin but still very very pretty so much so that i was quite astonished well and this young girl was the daughter of the lady in mourning though it was very cold yet a thin gown of black cotton with white spots and a small shabby mourning shawl that was all she had on her and their rooms were wretched imagine sir two little rooms very neat but nearly empty and so cold that i was almost froze there was not a spark of fire in the grate nor any appearance of there having been any for a very long time all the furniture was two beds two chairs a chest of drawers an old portmanteau and the small secretaire and on the chest was a parcel wrapped in a pocket handkerchief this small parcel was all the mother and child had left when their furniture was once sold the landlord had taken the two bedsteads the chairs a trunk and a table for what was due to him as the porter said who had gone upstairs with us then the lady begged me fairly to estimate the mattresses sheets curtains and quilts and as i am an honest woman sir although it is my business to buy cheap and sell dear yet when i saw the poor young thing with her eyes full of tears and her mother who in spite of her affected calmness seemed to be weeping in her heart i offered for the things fifteen francs more than they were worth to sell again i swear i did i agreed too just to oblige them to take the small secretaire although it is not a sort of thing i ever deal in i will buy it of you madame bouvard will you though so much the better sir for it is else likely to stay with me for some time i took it as i say only to oblige the poor lady i told her then what i would give her for the things and i expected that she would haggle a bit and ask me something more i did then it was that i saw she was not one of the common she was in downright misery she was and no mistake about it i am sure i says to her it's worse so much she answers me and says very well let us go back to your shop and you can pay me there for we shall not return here again to this house then she says to her daughter who was sitting on the trunk a crying claire take this bundle i remember the name and i'm sure she called her claire then the young lady got up but as she was crossing the room as she came to the little secretaire she went down on her knees before it and dear heart how the poor thing did sob courage my dear child remember some one sees you said her mother to her in a low voice but yet i heard her you may tell sir they were poor but very proud notwithstanding when the lady gave me the key of the little secretaire i saw a tear in her red eyes and it seemed as if her very heart bled at parting with this old piece of furniture but she tried to keep up her courage and not seem downcast before strangers then she told the porter that i should come and take away all that the landlord did not keep and after that we came back here the young lady gave her arm to her mother and carried in her hand the small bundle which contained all they possessed in the world i handed them their three hundred and fifteen francs and then i never saw them again but their name i don't know the lady sold me the things in the presence of the porter and so i had no occasion to ask her name for what she sold belonged to her but their new address i don't know that either no doubt they know at their old lodging no sir for when i went back to get the things the porter told me speaking of the mother and daughter that they were very quiet people 
very respectable and very unfortunate i hope no misfortune has happened to them they appear to be very calm and composed but i am sure they were quite in despair and where are they gone now to lodge i asked ma foi i don't know was the answer they left without telling me and i am sure they will not return here the hopes which rodolph had entertained for a moment vanished how could he go to work to discover these two unfortunate females when all the trace he had of them was that the young daughter's name was claire and the fragment of a letter of which we have already made mention and at the bottom of which were these words to write to madame de lucenay for monsieur de saint remy the only and very remote chance of discovering the traces of these unfortunates was through madame de lucenay who fortunately was on intimate terms with madame d'harville here ma'am be so good as to take your money said rodolph to the shopkeeper handing her a note for five hundred francs i will give you the change sir what is your address rue du temple number seventeen rue du temple number seventeen oh very well very well i know it have you ever been to that house often first i bought the furniture of a woman there who lent money on wages it is not a very creditable business to be sure but that's no affair of mine she sells i buy and so that's settled another time not six weeks ago i went there again for the furniture of a young man who lived on the fourth floor and was moving away monsieur francois germain perhaps said rodolph just so did you know him very well and unfortunately he has not left his present address in the rue du temple so i do not know where to find him but where shall we find a cart to take the goods as it is not far a large truck will do and old jerome is close by my regular commissionaire if you wish to know the address of m francois germain i can help you what do you know where he lives not exactly but i know where you may be sure to meet with him where at the notary's where he works at a notary's yes who lives in the rue du sentier m jacques ferrand exclaimed rodolph yes and a very worthy man he is there is a crucifix and some holy boxwood in his study it looks just as if one was in a sacristy but how did you know that m germain worked at this notary's why this way this young man came to me to ask me to buy his little lot of furniture all of a lump so that time too though rather out of my line i bought all his kit and brought it here because he seemed a nice young fellow and i had a pleasure in obliging him well i bought him right clean out and i paid him well he was no doubt very well satisfied for a fortnight afterwards he came again to buy some bed furniture from me a commissionaire with a truck went with him everything was packed well but at the moment he was going to pay me lo and behold he had forgotten his purse but he looked so like an honest man that i said to him take the things with you never mind i shall be passing your way and will call for the money very good says he but i am never at home so call to-morrow in the rue du sentier at m jacques ferrand's the notary where i am employed and i will pay you i went next day and he paid me only what was very odd to me was that he sold his things and then a fortnight afterwards he buys others rodolph thought that he was able to account for this singular fact germain was desirous of destroying every trace from the wretches who were pursuing him fearing no doubt that his removal might put them on the scent of his fresh abode he had preferred in order to avoid this danger selling his goods and afterwards buying others the prince was overjoyed to think of the happiness in store for madame georges who would thus at length see again that son so long and vainly sought rigolette now returned with a joyful eye and smiling lips well did not i tell you so she exclaimed i am not deceived we shall have spent six hundred and forty francs altogether and the morels will be set up like princes here come the shopkeepers are they not loaded nothing will now be wanting for the family they will have everything requisite even to a gridiron two newly tinned saucepans and a coffee-pot i said to myself since they are to have things done so grandly let them be grand and with all that i shall not have lost more than three hours but come neighbour pay as quickly as you can and let us be gone it will soon be noon 
and my needle must go at a famous rate to make up for this morning rodolph paid and quitted the temple with rigolette at the moment when the grisette and her companion were entering the passage they were almost knocked over by madame pipelet who was running out frightened troubled and aghast mercy on us said rigolette what ails you madame pipelet where are you running to in that manner is it you mademoiselle rigolette exclaimed anastasie it is providence that sends you help me to save the life of alfred what do you mean the darling old duck has fainted have mercy on us run for me and get me two sous worth of absinthe at the dram shop the strongest mind it is his remedy when he is indisposed in the pylorus that generally sets him up again be kind and do not refuse me i can then return to alfred i am all over in such a fluster rigolette let go rodolph's arm and ran quickly to the dram shop but what has happened madame pipelet inquired rodolph following the portress into the lodge how can i tell you my worthy sir i had gone out to the mayor's to church and the cook-shop to save alfred so much trotting about i returned and what should i see but the dear old cosset with his legs and arms all in the air there monsieur rodolph said anastasie opening the door of her dog-hole say if that is not enough to break one's heart lamentable spectacle with his bell-crowned hat still on his head even further on than usual for the ambiguous castor pushed down no doubt by violence to judge by a transverse gap covered m pipelet's eyes who was on his back on the ground at the foot of his bed the fainting was over and alfred was beginning to make some slight gesticulations with his hands as if he sought to repulse somebody or something and then he tried to push off this troublesome visor with which he had been bonneted he kicks that's a beautiful symptom he comes too exclaimed the porteress who stooping down bawled in his ears what's the matter with my alfred it's his stasie who is with him how goes it now there's some absinthe coming that will set you up then assuming a falsetto voice of much endearment she added what did they abuse and assassinate him the dear old darling the delight of his stasi hey alfred heaved an immense sigh and with a mighty groan uttered the fatal word cabrion and his tremulous hands again seemed desirous of repulsing the fearful vision cabrion what that cussed painter again exclaimed madame pipelet alfred dreamed of him all night long so that he kicked me almost to death this monster is his nightmare not only does he poison his days but he poisons his nights also he pursues him in his very sleep yes sir as though alfred was a malefactor and this cabrion whom may heaven confound was his unceasing remorse rodolph smiled discreetly detecting some new freak of rigolette's former neighbour alfred answer me don't remain mute you frighten me said madame pipelet let's try and get you up why lovey do you keep thinking of that vagabond fellow you know that when you think of that fellow it has the same effect on you that cabbage has it fills up your pylorus and stifles you cabrion repeated m pipelet pushing up with an effort the hat which had fallen so low over his eyes which he rolled around him with an affrighted air rigolette entered carrying a small bottle of absinthe thank ye mamselle you are so kind said the old body and then she added come dearie suck this down that will make you all right and anastasie presenting the phial quickly to m pipelet's lips contrived to make him swallow the absinthe in vain did alfred struggle vigorously his wife taking advantage of the victim's weakness held up his head firmly with one hand whilst with the other she introduced the neck of the little bottle between his teeth and compelled him to swallow the absinthe after which she exclaimed triumphantly there now you're on your pins again my ducky and alfred having wiped his mouth with the back of his hand opened his eyes rose and inquired in accents of alarm have you seen him who is he gone who alfred cabrion has he dared asked the porteress m pipelet as mute as a statue of the commandant like that redoubtable spectre bowed his head twice with an affirmative air what has m cabrion been here inquired rigolette 
repressing a violent desire to laugh what has the monster been unchained on alfred said madame pipelet oh if i had been there with my broom he should have swallowed it handle and all but tell us alfred all about this horrid affair m pipelet made signs with his hand that he was about to speak and they listened to the man with the bell-crowned hat in religious silence whilst he expressed himself in these terms and in a voice of deep emotion my wife had left me to save me the trouble of going out according to the request of monsieur bowing to rodolph to the mayor's to church and the cook-shop the dear old darling had had the nightmare all night and i wished to save him the journey said anastasie this nightmare was sent me as a warning from on high responded the porter religiously i had dreamed of cabrion and i was to suffer from cabrion here was i sitting quietly in front of my table reflecting on an alteration which i wished to make in the upper leather of this boot confided to my hands when i heard a noise a rustling at the window of my lodge was it a presentiment a warning from on high my heart beat i lifted up my head and through the pane of glass i saw i saw cabrion exclaimed anastasie clasping her hands cabrion replied m pipelet gloomily his hideous face was there pressed close against the window and he was looking at me with eyes like a cat's what do i say a tiger's just as in my dream i tried to speak but my tongue clave to my mouth i tried to rise i was nailed to my seat my boot fell from my hands and as in all the critical and important events of my life i remained perfectly motionless then the key turned in the lock the door opened cabrion entered he entered audacious monster replied madame pipelet as much astonished as her spouse at such audacity he entered slowly resumed alfred stopped a moment at the threshold as if to fascinate me with his look atrocious as it was then he advanced towards me pausing at each step and piercing me through with his eye but not uttering a word straight mute and threatening as a phantom i declare my very heart aches to hear him said anastasie i remain still more motionless and glued to my chair cabrion still advanced slowly towards me fixing his eye as the serpent glares at the bird he so frightened me that in spite of myself i kept my eye on him he came close to me and then i could no longer endure his revolting aspect it was too much and i could not i shut my eyes and then i felt that he dared to place his hands upon my hat which he took by the crown and lifted gently off my head leaving it bare i began to be seized with vertigo my breathing was suspended there was a singing in my ears and i was completely fastened to my seat and i closed my eyes still closer and closer then cabrion stooped took my head between his hands which were as cold as death and on my forehead covered with an icy damp he deposited a brazen kiss indecent wretch anastasie lifted her hands towards heaven my enemy the most deadly imprinted a kiss on my forehead such a monstrosity overcame and paralyzed me cabrion profited by my stupor to place my hat on my head and then with a blow of his fist drove it down over my eyes as you saw this last outrage destroyed me the measure was full all about me was turning around and i fainted at the moment when i saw him from under the rim of my hat leave the lodge as quietly and slowly as he had entered then as if the recital had exhausted all his strength m pipelet fell back in his chair raising his hands to heaven in a manner of mute imprecation rigolette went out quickly she could not restrain herself any longer her desire to laugh almost stifled her 
rodolph had the greatest difficulty to keep his countenance suddenly there was a confused murmur such as announces the arrival of a mob heard from the street and a great noise came from the door at the top of the entrance and then butts of grounded muskets were heard on the steps of the door End of chapter one part three read by celine major chapter two of the mysteries of paris volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by celine major the mysteries of paris volume three by eugene Sue. chapter two the arrest part one good gracious monsieur rodolph exclaimed rigolette running in pale and trembling the commissary of police and the guard have come here divine justice watches over me said m pipelet in a transport of pious gratitude they have come to arrest cabrion unfortunately it is too late a commissary of police wearing his tricolored scarf around his waist underneath his black coat entered the lodge his countenance was impressive magisterial and serious monsieur le commissaire is too late the malefactor has escaped said m pipelet in a sorrowful voice but i will give you his description villainous smile impudent look insulting of whom do you speak inquired the magistrate of cabrion monsieur le commissaire but perhaps if you make all haste it is not yet too late to catch him added m pipelet i know nothing about any cabrion said the magistrate impatiently does one jerome morel a working lapidary live in this house yes mon commissaire said madame pipelet putting herself into a military attitude conduct me to his apartment morel the lapidary said the porteress excessively surprised why he is the mildest lambkin in the world he is incapable of does jerome morel live here or not he lives here sir with his family in one of the attics lead me to his attic then addressing himself to a man who accompanied him the magistrate said let two of the municipal guard wait below and not leave the entrance send jesting for a hackney coach the man left the lodge to put these orders in execution now continued the magistrate addressing himself to m pipelet lead me to morel if it is all the same to you mon commissaire i will do that for alfred he is indisposed from cabrion's behaviour which just as the cabbage does troubles his pylorus you or your husband it is no matter which go forward and preceded by madame pipelet he ascended the staircase but soon stopped when he saw rodolphe and rigolette following him who are you and what do you want he inquired they are two lodgers in the fourth story said madame pipelet i beg your pardon sir i did not know that you belonged to the house said he to rodolphe the latter arguing well from the polite behaviour of the magistrate said to him you are going to see a family in a state of deep misery sir i do not know what fresh stroke of ill-fortune threatens this unhappy artisan but he has been cruelly tried last night one of his daughters worn down by illness is dead before his eyes dead from cold and misery is it possible it is indeed the fact mon commissaire said madame pipelet but for this gentleman who speaks to you and who is a king of lodgers for he has saved poor morel from prison by his generosity the whole family of the lapidary must have died of hunger the commissary looked at rodolphe with equal surprise and interest nothing is more easily explained sir said rodolphe a person who is very charitable learning that morel whose honour and honesty i will guarantee to you was in a most deplorable and unmerited state of distress authorised me to pay a bill of exchange for which the bailiffs were about to drag off to prison this poor workman the sole support of his numerous family the magistrate in his turn struck by the noble physiognomy of rodolph as well as the dignity of his manners replied i have no doubt of morel's probity i only regret that i have to fulfil a painful duty in your presence sir who have so deeply interested yourself in this family what do you mean sir from the services you have rendered to the morels and your language i see sir that you are a worthy person having besides no reason for concealing the object of the warrant which i have to execute 
i will confess to you that i am about to apprehend louise morel the lapidary's daughter the recollection of the rouleau of gold offered to the bailiffs by the young girl occurred to rodolph of what is she then accused she lies under a charge of child murder she she oh her poor father from what you have told me sir i imagine that under the miserable circumstances in which this artisan is this fresh blow will be terrible for him unfortunately i must carry out the full instructions with which i am charged but it is at present only an accusation asked rodolph proofs no doubt are still wanting i cannot tell you more on that point justice has been informed of this crime or rather the presumptive crime by the statement of an individual most respectable in every particular louise morel's master jacques ferrand the notary said rodolph with indignation yes sir m jacques ferrand is a wretch sir i am pained to see that you do not know the person of whom you speak sir m jacques ferrand is one of the most honourable men in the world his rectitude is universally recognised i repeat to you sir that this notary is a wretch it was he who sought to send morel to prison because his daughter repulsed his libidinous proposals if louise is only accused on the denunciation of such a man you must own sir that the charge deserves but very little credit it is not my affair sir and i am very glad of it to discuss the depositions of m ferrand said the magistrate coldly justice is informed in this matter and it is for a court of law to decide as for me i have a warrant to apprehend louise morel and that warrant i must put into execution you are quite right sir and i regret that an impulse of feeling however just should have made me forget for a moment that this was neither the time nor the place for such a discussion one word only the corpse of the child which morel has lost is still in the attic and i have offered my apartments to the family to spare them the sad spectacle of the dead body you will therefore find the lapidary and possibly his daughter in my rooms i entreat you sir in the name of humanity do not apprehend louise abruptly in the midst of the unhappy family only a short time since snatched from their state of utter wretchedness morel has had so many shocks during this night that it is really to be feared his reason may sink under it already his wife is dangerously ill and such a blow would kill him sir i have always executed my orders with every possible consideration and i shall act similarly now will you allow me sir to ask you one favour it is this the young female who is following us occupies an apartment close to mine which i have no doubt she would place at your disposal you could in the first instance send for louise and if necessary for morel afterwards that his daughter may take leave of him you will thus save a poor sick and infirm mother from a very distressing scene most willingly sir if it can be so arranged the conversation we have just described was carried on in an undertone whilst rigolette and madame pipelet kept away discreetly a few steps distance from the commissary and rodolph the latter then went to the grisette whom the presence of the commissary had greatly affrighted and said to her my good little neighbour i want another service from you i want you to leave your room at my disposal for the next hour as long as you please monsieur rodolph you have the key but oh say what is the matter i will tell you all by and by but i want something more you must return to the temple and tell them not to bring our purchases here for the next hour to be sure i will monsieur rodolph but has any fresh misfortune befallen the morels alas yes something very sad indeed which you will learn but too soon well then neighbour i will run to the temple alas alas i was thinking that thanks to your kindness these poor people had been quite relieved from their trouble said the grisette who then descended the staircase very quickly rodolph had been very desirous of sparing rigolette the distressing scene of louise morel's arrest mon commissaire said madame pipelet since my king of lodgers will direct you i may return to my alfred i am uneasy about him for when i left him he had hardly recovered from his indisposition which cabrion had caused go go said the magistrate who was thus left alone with rodolph they both ascended to the landing-place on the fourth story at the door of the chamber in which the lapidary and his family had been temporarily established suddenly the door opened 
louise pale and in tears came out quickly adieu adieu father she exclaimed i will come back again but i must go now louise my child listen to me a moment said morel following his daughter and endeavouring to detain her at the sight of rodolph and the magistrate louise and the lapidary remained motionless ah sir you our kind benefactor said the artisan recognising rodolph assist me in preventing louise from leaving us i do not know what is the matter with her but she quite frightens me she is so determined to go but there is no occasion for her to return to her master is there sir did you not say to me louise shall not again leave you and that will recompense you for much that you have suffered ah at that kind of promise i confess that for a moment i had forgot the death of my poor little adele but i must not again be separated from thee louise oh never never rodolph was wounded to the heart and was unable to utter a word in reply the commissary said sternly to louise is your name louise morel yes sir replied the young girl quite overcome you are jerome morel her father added the magistrate addressing the lapidary rodolph had opened the door of rigolette's apartment yes sir but go in there with your daughter and the magistrate pointed to rigolette's chamber into which rodolph had already entered reassured by his preserver the lapidary and louise astonished and uneasy did as the commissary desired them the commissary shut the door and said with much feeling to morel i know that you are honest and unfortunate and it is therefore with regret that i tell you that i am here in the name of the law to apprehend your daughter all is discovered i am lost cried louise in agony and throwing herself into her father's arms what do you say what do you say inquired morel stupefied you are mad what do you mean by lost apprehend you why apprehend you who has come to apprehend you i and in the name of the law and the commissary showed his scarf oh wretched wretched girl exclaimed louise falling on her knees what in the name of the law said the artisan whose reason severely shaken by this fresh blow began to totter why apprehend my daughter in the name of the law i will answer for louise i will this is my child my good child ain't you louise what apprehend you when our good angel has restored you to us to console us for the death of our poor dear little adele come come this can't be and then to speak respectfully monsieur le commissaire they apprehend none but the bad you know and my louise is not bad so you see my dear the good gentleman is mistaken my name is morel but there are other morels you are louise but there are other louises so you see monsieur le commissaire there is a mistake certainly some mistake unhappily there is no mistake louise morel take leave of your father what are you going to take my daughter away exclaimed the workman furious with grief and advancing towards the magistrate with a menacing air rodolph seized the lapidary by the arm and said to him be calm and hope for the best your daughter will be restored to you her innocence must be proved she cannot be guilty guilty of what she is not guilty of anything i will put my hand in the fire if then remembering the gold which louise had brought to pay the bill with morel cried but the money that money you had this morning louise and he gave his daughter a terrible look louise understood it i rob she exclaimed and her cheeks suffused with generous indignation her tone and gesture reassured her father i knew it well enough he exclaimed you see monsieur le commissaire she denies it and i swear to you that she never told me a lie in her life and everybody that knows her will say the same thing as i do she lie oh no she is too proud to do that and then the bill has been paid by our benefactor the gold she does not wish to keep but will return it to the person who lent it to her desiring him not to tell any one won't you louise your daughter is not accused of theft said the magistrate well then what is the charge against her i her father swear to you that she is innocent of whatever crime they may accuse her of and i never told a lie in my life either why should you know what she is charged with said rodolph moved by his distress 
louise's innocence will be proved the person who takes so great an interest in you will protect your daughter come come courage courage this time providence will not forsake you embrace your daughter and you will soon see her again monsieur le commissaire cried morel not attending to rodolph you are going to deprive a father of his daughter without even naming the crime of which she is accused let me know all louise why don't you speak your daughter is accused of child murder said the magistrate i i i child mur i don't you and morel aghast stammered incoherently your daughter is accused of having killed her child said the commissary deeply touched at this scene but it is not yet proved that she has committed this crime oh no i have not sir i have not exclaimed louise energetically and rising i swear to you that it was dead it never breathed it was cold i lost my senses this is my crime but kill my child oh never never your child abandoned girl cried morel raising his hands towards louise as if he would annihilate her by this gesture and imprecation pardon father pardon she exclaimed after a moment's fearful silence morel resumed with a calm that was even more frightful monsieur le commissaire take away that creature she is not my child the lapidary turned to leave the room but louise threw herself at his knees around which she clung with both arms and with her head thrown back distracted and supplicating she exclaimed father hear me only hear me monsieur le commissaire away with her i beseech you i leave her to you said the lapidary struggling to free himself from louise's embrace listen to her said rodolph holding him do not be so pitiless to her to her repeated morel lifting his two hands to his forehead to a dishonoured wretch a wanton oh a wanton but if she were dishonoured through her efforts to save you said rodolph to him in a low voice these words made a sudden and painful impression on morel and he cast his eyes on his weeping child still on her knees before him then with a searching look impossible to describe he cried in a hollow voice clenching his teeth with rage the notary an answer came to louise's lips she was about to speak but paused no doubt a reflection and bending down her head remained silent no no he sought to imprison me this morning continued morel with a violent burst can it be he ah so much the better so much the better she has not even an excuse for her crime she never thought of me in her dishonour and i may curse her without remorse no no do not curse me my father i will tell you all to you alone and you will see you will see whether or not i deserve your forgiveness for pity's sake hear her said rodolph to him what will she tell me her infamy that will soon be public and i can wait till then sir said louise addressing the magistrate for pity's sake leave me alone with my father that i may say a few words to him before i leave him perhaps for ever and before you also our benefactor i will speak but only before you and my father be it so said the magistrate will you be pitiless and refuse this last consolation to your child asked rodolph of morel if you think you owe me any gratitude for the kindness which i have been enabled to show you consent to your daughter's entreaties after a moment's sad and angry silence morel replied i will but where shall we go inquired rodolph your family are in the other room where shall we go exclaimed the lapidary with a bitter irony where shall we go up above up above into the garret by the side of the body of my dead daughter that spot will well suit a confession will it not come along come and we will see if louise will dare to tell a lie in the presence of her sister's corpse come come along and morel went out hastily with a wild air and turning his face from louise sir said the commissary to rodolph in an undertone i beg you for this poor man's sake not to protract this conversation you were right when you said his reason was touched just now his look was that of a madman alas sir 
i am equally fearful with yourself of some fresh and terrible disaster i will abridge as much as i can this most painful farewell and rodolph rejoined the lapidary and his daughter however strange and painful morel's determination might appear it was really the only thing that under the circumstances could be done the magistrate consented to await the issue of this conversation in rigolette's chamber the morel family were occupying rodolph's apartment and there was only the garret at liberty and it was into this horrid retreat that louise her father and rodolph betook themselves sad and affecting sight in the middle of the attic which we have already described there lay stretched on the idiot's mattress the body of the little girl who had died in the morning now covered by a ragged cloth the unusual and clear light reflected through the narrow skylight through the figures of the three actors in this scene into bold relief rodolph standing up was leaning with his back against the wall deeply moved morel seated at the edge of his working bench with his head bent his hands hanging listless by his sides whilst his gaze fixed and fierce rested on and did not quit the mattress on which the remains of his poor little adele were deposited at this spectacle the anger and indignation of the lapidary subsided and were changed to inexpressible bitterness his energy left him and he was utterly prostrated beneath this fresh blow louise who was ghastly pale felt her strength forsake her the revelation she was about to make terrified her still she ventured tremblingly to take her father's hand that miserable and shrivelled hand withered and wasted by excess of toil the lapidary did not withdraw it and then his daughter sobbing as if her heart would burst covered it with kisses and felt it slightly pressed against her lips morel's wrath had ended and then his tears long repressed flowed freely and bitterly oh father if you only knew exclaimed louise if you only knew how much i am to be pitied oh louise this this will be the heaviest bitter in my cup for the rest of my life all my life long replied the lapidary weeping terribly you you in prison in the same bench with criminals you so proud when you had a right to be proud no he resumed in a fresh burst of grief and despair no i would rather have seen you in your shroud beside your poor little sister and i i would sooner be there replied louise be silent unhappy girl you pain me i was wrong to say so i have been too harsh come speak but in the name of heaven do not lie however frightful the truth may be yet tell me it all let me learn it from your lips and it will be less cruel speak for alas our moments are counted they are waiting for you down below ah oh, just heaven what a sad sad parting my father i will tell you all everything replied louise taking courage but promise me and our kind benefactor must promise me also not to repeat this to any person to any person if he knew that i had told oh and she shuddered as she spoke you would be destroyed destroyed as i am for you know not the power and ferocity of this man what man my master the notary yes said louise in a whisper and looking around her as if she feared to be overheard take courage said rodolph no matter how cruel and powerful this man may be we will defeat him besides if i reveal what you are about to tell us it would only be in the interest of yourself or your father and me too louise if i speak it would be in endeavouring to save you but what has this villain done this is not all said louise after a moment's reflection in this recital there will be a person implicated who has rendered me a great service who has shown the utmost kindness to my father and family this person was in the employ of m ferrand when i entered his service and he made me take an oath not to disclose his name rodolph believing that she referred to germain said to louise if you mean francois germain make your mind tranquil his secret shall be kept by your father and myself louise looked at rodolph with surprise do you know him said she what was the good excellent young man who lived here for three months employed at the notary's when he went to his service said morel the first time you met him here you appeared as if you had never seen him before it was agreed between us father 
he had serious reasons why he did not wish it known that he was working at m ferrand's it was i who told him of the room to let on the fourth story here knowing that he would be a good neighbour for you but inquired rodolph who then placed your daughter at the notary's during the illness of my wife i said to madame burette the woman who advanced money on pledges who lived in this house that louise wished to get into service in order to assist us madame burette knew the notary's housekeeper and gave me a letter to her in which she recommended louise as a very good girl cursed letter it was the cause of all our misfortune this was the way sir that my daughter got into the notary's service although i know some of the causes which excited m ferrand's hatred against your father said rodolph to louise i beg you to tell me as shortly as possible what passed between you and the notary after your entering into his service it may perhaps be useful to your defence when i first went into m ferrand's house said louise i had nothing to complain of with respect to him i had a great deal to do and the housekeeper often scolded me and the house was very dull but i endured everything very patiently service is service and perhaps elsewhere i should have other disagreeables m ferrand was a very stern-looking person he went to mass and frequently had priests in his house i did not at all distrust him for at first he hardly ever looked at me spoke short and cross especially when there were any strangers except the porter who lived at the entrance in the same part of the house as the office is in i was the only servant with madame seraphin the housekeeper the pavilion that we occupied was isolated between the court and the garden my bedroom was high up i was often afraid being as i was always alone either in the kitchen which is underground or in my bedroom one day i had worked very late mending some things that were required in a hurry and then i was going to bed when i heard footsteps moving quietly in the little passage at the end of which my room was situated some one stopped at my door at first i supposed it was the housekeeper but as no one entered i began to be alarmed i dared not move but i listened however i heard no one yet i was sure that there was some one behind my door i asked twice who was there but no one answered i then pushed my chest of drawers against the door which had neither lock nor bolt i still listened but nothing stirred so at the end of half an hour which seemed very long to me i threw myself on my bed and the night passed quietly the next morning i asked the housekeeper's leave to have a bolt put on my door which had no fastening telling her of my fright on the previous night and she told me i had been dreaming and that if i wanted a bolt i must ask m ferrand for it when i asked him he shrugged his shoulders and said i was crazy so i did not dare say any more about it some time after this the misfortune about the diamond happened my father in his despair did not know what to do i told madame seraphin of his distress and she replied monsieur is so charitable perhaps he will do something for your father the same afternoon when i was waiting at the table m ferrand said to me suddenly your father is in want of thirteen hundred francs go and tell him to come to my office this evening and he shall have the money at this mark of kindness i burst into tears and did not know how to thank him when he said with his usual bluntness very good very good oh what i do is nothing the same evening after my work i came to my father to tell him the good news the next day i had the thirteen hundred francs giving him my acceptance in blank at three months date said morel i did like louise and wept with gratitude called this man my benefactor oh what a wretch must he be thus to destroy the gratitude and veneration i entertained for him this precaution of making you give him a blank acceptance at a date falling due so soon that you could not meet it must have raised your suspicion said rodolph no sir i only thought the notary took it for security that was all besides he told me that i need not think about repaying this sum in less than two years but that every three months the bill would be renewed for the sake of greater regularity it was however duly presented here on the day it became due but as you may suppose was not paid the usual course of law was followed up and judgment was obtained against me in the name of a third party all this i was desired not to feel any uneasiness respecting as it had been caused by an error on the part of the officer in whose hands the bill had been placed his motive is very evident said rodolph 
he wished to have you entirely in his power alas sir it was from the very day in which he obtained judgment that he commenced but go on louise go on i scarcely know where i am my head seems giddy and bewildered and at times my memory entirely fails me i fear my senses are leaving me and that i shall become mad oh this is too much too hard to bear rodolph having succeeded in tranquillizing the lapidary louise thus proceeded with a view to prove my gratitude to m ferrand for all his kindness towards my family i redoubled my endeavours to serve him well and faithfully from that time the housekeeper appeared to take an utter aversion to me and to embrace every opportunity of rendering me uncomfortable continually exposing me to anger by withholding from me the various orders given by m ferrand all this made me extremely miserable and i would gladly have sought another place but the knowledge of my father's pecuniary obligation to my master prevented my following my inclinations the money had now been lent about three months and though m ferrand still continued harsh and unkind to me in the presence of madame seraphin he began casting looks of a peculiar and embarrassing description at me whenever he could do so unobserved and would smile and seem amused when he perceived the confusion it occasioned me take notice i beg sir that it was at this very time the necessary legal proceedings for enabling him at any moment to deprive me of my liberty were going on end of chapter two part one read by celine major